You know, so many times uh, people just kind of walk through Christian holidays and they really don't pay attention to what the holiday is about. And I'm telling you, man, Christmas should be a time of thanksgiving. We should just thank him. We should thank him all the time anyway. But it's a remembrance of what God's done, that he sent his son, who was very comfortable in heaven, to come down here and to save us. And we should, all, we should be so grateful for that and just not get so caught up in the uh, uh, commercial side of everything and the stress of Christmas and the finance of Christmas, but to remember what it is we're celebrating. It is Christmas, not Santa Clausmas. <laughs> all right, if you'll open your um, Bibles to Judges 16, we will wrap up tonight the study of um, Samson, which has been a great study once again. Uh, as we come to the end of the story of Samson, we are once reminded of the nation of Israel and the church. Remember, Samson is sometimes can be a shadow and a type of Jesus himself, and then other times his flesh part really is an example of the church and all. And you know, it's the great thing about the Old Testament is the Old Testament will continually give you bits of information and show you shadows, show you personalities and types of the Bible. It's created, the Old Testament, so that when you do get in the New Testament, when you do see Jesus, then you already know who he is. You know his characters. You know his traits. And tonight it's really kind of full of them. The whole, the whole part of Samson is because Samson just battled with the lust of the eye. He just, and, and understand the lust of the eye is not just, it is in Samson's case, not just uh, sexual things. It can be a lot of things. You know, if you have a lust of life for, for life, you want to be better off than you are, you, you're jealous of this person because they got a bigger car, bigger house, more intelligence, prettier kids, you know, that, that right there will destroy you. <laughs> Did I just reveal so many? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> That's funny. All right, I'm going to move on. Okay, so Israel and the church continually prostituted. The Bible uses that very word continually prostitutes themselves with the world and God wants us to be set apart. He wants us to serve him and him only and yet over and over Israel did what they thought was good in their own eyes which put them in bondage and away from God which is exactly what happened to Samson. Samson as you'll see tonight ended up in a very poor state because the, the presence of God is actually going to leave him in the, at the end of this chapter and the worst part of it is that he doesn't even know it. That's the sad part. If you don't know, don't feel the presence of God, then there's a problem. All right, so let's look in uh, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the uh, Gaziacs were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in, lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it's daylight, we'll kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, if you remember, in verse 1, it says, Now Samson went to Gaza and saw. That was his problem. That was his problem. He went places he never should have been. He was with women that he should never have been with. He, it was like his eye was the gateway to the sin that he was, he was, he was going to be in. And, and that's very important. That's why you have to keep yourself holy and true and keep, your away, keep yourself away from R-rated movies. Don't watch junk on TV. I, I'll be honest, about the only thing you watch now is, is you know, maybe cartoons. And even some of those are like, you're going, oh my God, what happened? But you have to be very, very careful who you surround yourself with, who you're with on a regular basis. You just have to be careful and you have to guard your spirit because Samson definitely did not do that. So he goes to Gaza, uh, which I think is interesting. I mean, Gaza still exists. It's a Palestine territory within the borders of Israel. But he goes to Ga Gaza, which is a large Philistine city. In fact, some say it was probably the capital of it. Uh, and, and when I first read this, I thought, wow, how careless. You know, just a little while ago, he had gone and killed a thousand Philistines. You know, they tried to capture him and, and he ran away and hid and whatever. Uh, but now, because of his carelessness, 
He's now come into a major city, and I mean, of course, he, somebody's going to recognize him, and that's exactly what happened. But despite the threat that he, he saw or he felt, his flesh drew him in. His eyes drew him in. That sin drew him out. But now, when I read this part about the gate, it says when Samson realized, well, when Samson realized that they had locked the city gates and were waiting to capture him, it says he took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on the shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. I, I'm telling you, n nobody can tell me that God does not have a sense of humor because here he is, he's waiting. They're going, okay, in the morning when he gets up, we're going to wait at the gate when he comes out and we're going to get him. So what does he do? He gets up at midnight. He gets up at midnight, goes, and he just takes the gate with him. I mean, he takes the gate, he takes the post, he takes them all and carries them on his back, and he goes and he puts them on the uh, on the hill of Hebron. Now you got you might go, well, why didn't he just throw them to the side? Because he was making a statement. If you remember in the last chapter, uh, the men of Hebron, which were the uh, men of Judah had actually come to him, come to Samson, because the Philistines were saying, we're coming to, you know, we're going to wage war on you. And, and the men of Judah were going, for what? And they said, because you're hiding, um, you're hiding Samson. And so they go to where they know he's hiding and say, hey, come on, you know, you're going to, you, we, we have to take you in. Don't you realize that they control us, that they are over us, which was a sad state, as, as Pastor Johnny was saying, that they were in because they didn't recognize God as their leader. They didn't recognize God as their protector. They saw the Philistines. And so they take him, bind him, and they give him to the Philistines. And that's when he takes the jawbone and, and, and kills a thousand of them. And so when he takes that, that gate and those posts, it says not only did he take you know, the gate, he took the posts that were cemented, well, they weren't cemented, that were dug way down. He took them with him too. And he sets them right there on Hebron. And the thing about Hebron is Hebron faces right into the, the tribes of Judah. And so when they get up that next morning, they're going to see those gates. God's good, man. He, he, he'll... <laughs> He'll take his revenge however he does. So the thing that I think most people uh, think of when they say that and say, God, he's right in the middle of sin. Why did God use him? And I read this. It says, despite Samson's sin, God still gave Samson supernatural strength to escape the Philippines. He does not, it just does not mean that God overlooked Samson's sin. It just means that he took a bad situation and he made it well. He made it good. Now, if you look at me, if you, I think I have the slide up here for Genesis 50, 20, because when I read this, I thought of Joseph. And this is what Joseph is telling his brothers. If you remember, Joseph's brothers uh, didn't, didn't like him. They sold him into slavery. And then years later, when he's over all of Egypt and there's a big plague, they come to him for food. And they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And this is what Joseph says to him. But as for, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is in this day to save many people alive. God did this because God's purpose was bigger than Samson himself. The Bible also tells us that um, many times, no, not many times, that there's somebody that is a head of a government, that is a head of a state, whatever, that it, that person was placed by God. Either he physically places him there or he allows him there. And the reason being is because God's will will be done. It will be done. Whether if there's a Christian that, that stands up and does what he needs to do, but if not, he'll use a sinner also. It's God's will and the things he wants to do is accomplished. And that's the same way with Samson. He had high hopes for Samson. He thought Samson was going to be a, a great leader. He, he was wishing he would be a great leader. And he failed him. But he used him anyway. He used him anyway. Verse 4. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strengths lie, and by what means he may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, when I've read this story in, in, in the past, I've always thought, Wow, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot of money. But if you look back in chapter 3, it talks about the Philistines and how they were set up. They, were, they had five territories, and each one of the five territories had five lords or five, five kings that were over them. And uh, so they come to Delilah. 
Now, now think about this. It's just an ordinary girl. They come to the liar, send a spokeswoman or other, and they say, hey, uh, we will give you, how much was it? 1,100 pieces of silver, all five of us. Each one of them will do that. And so I did a little cal calculations and all, and I went back and looked, and it's not a, it's not a precise thing, but the amount in dollars today was like $80,000. That's a lot of money. I mean, I guess all along, I mean, if it had been 150, she probably wouldn't have done it. If it had been 500 or 1,000, she probably wouldn't have done it. But $80,000, that's a life changer. So they come to her, not only probably intimidated her, and I'm not, making, I'm not making her out to be a saint. She is by far not a saint. But it makes the story a little more understandable that there was a, a large sum of money. $80,000 would change her and her family's lives forever and ever. And so that money was there to entice her to, uh, to, to trick him, to find out what it was that made him strong. This is also the scripture I was telling you about that uh, where... Uh, it lets us know that, that Samson was not um, a bodybuilder and his strength was not from his body. It was from the Holy Ghost. It was from his strength because they had no idea what made him strong. They were willing to pay a lot of money to find out what it was that was wrong with him. <clears throat> verse 6, not what was wrong with him, but what gave him his strength. Uh, verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become a weak and be like every other man. Verse 8, <clears throat> So the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound them with him. Now men were lying in wait, saying, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. The guys, which I'll get into later, the lords or whoever was representing the lords were there in the room with her. And when she tells him, you know, oh, please, please, please tell me what, you know, tell me what your strength is. And he plays games. He obviously likes to play games and it gets him in trouble. So he plays this game, says, you know, you know, if you take these strings, dried, whatever, put on me, you know, my strength will be gone. And, and, and it says, it says, now the men were laying in wait, staying with her in the room. But it didn't work. So she tries again. Verse 10. Then the Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to them, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men were, and men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. So again, Samson thinks he's witty. But the thing is, is Samson is aware that, men, that the men are there. I mean, it says it every single time. So he knows, he has no intentions at this point of ever telling them. He's not going to tell them. He's just playing a game with them. Verse 13. I'll start with there. Delilah said to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be, what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, he's getting closer to the truth. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. I, you know, you still have to wonder about his sanity. You know, you think, look, this has happened three times. They're in the room with them. And, and, and I, as I was studying this, I was going, Lord, why could he not see this? Why could he not see the deceit? And then I started, you know, I mean, he's about to give his anointing away to a woman that is trying to make money off of him. And he knows it. He knows it. And I thought, you know what? If you live in sin, before long it will become your reality. He was so far from God that he did not even see the deception. That's what happens to people. People get so far away from God and that, that you would like to take them and shake them and go, do you not see the deception you are in? Do you not see it? And they don't. 
They don't because they are so far away from God that it looks normal. And this is where Samson is at this point. He is so far from God that, that it just looks normal. And so he's just playing this horrible game that is gonna, that's going to get him killed is what it's going to get him. <clears throat> now at this point, it seems like the men have left. And it's just Delilah. And she still wants that money. And she still is trying to manipulate him into telling her the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. He's just nagging her to death. Or she is just nagging him to death. Verse 15. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. And he said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven... Then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lord Philistines came up to her and brought her the money in her hand. She thinks this is a real deal. They think it's a real deal. Verse 19, then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Undoubtedly, he had just braided it over the years into seven, which is ironic, isn't it? Uh, into seven um, braids. I had the Jamaica thing going. Then she began to torment it, or kind of like shake him and wake him, and his strength left him. He's had his hair cut. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and he said, I will go out before, as before, at other times, and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. It wasn't that they had shaven off his, his hair and that magically, you know, that was where his strength was. What had happened is he had, it was the last step. He had now given her the last thing that made his anointing work, so to speak. It wasn't that the hair did it. It was that he was so far from God that he was willing to give his anointing to this woman. And the Spirit of God had left him, and he didn't even know it. That's a sad state. That's a scary state. He could have been used so great by God, so great by God that he was deceived by a woman. 21. Then the Philistines took him and they put out his eyes. Isn't that ironic? Everything he, everything he did, he saw this woman, he saw this, he had a lust for, in his eyes. All this, the first thing they did with him was is they, they gorged his eyes out. And they brought him down to Gaza and they bound him with bronze fetters, bronze fetters and, and he became a grinder in a prison. They just kind of put him on a, he'd just go in a circle. They just kind of like a, like you do, a, is it a horse that you do that? You just round and round and round and it just grinded everything under him. 22, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. They did not even pay attention, the Philistines, to that. They didn't even pay attention to him. But in the Bible, a lot of times someone's long hair is, is, is represented as the glory of God. And so now he's in prison. He's beginning, he understands it now. He sees it. The girl, there are no girls. There is anything but a circle that he's going around. And his hair starts growing back. And that really represents that his faith starts to grow. He's starting to get that relationship back with God. It's coming back. It's coming back. His hair's growing. His beard's growing. It's all growing. And in spite of his horrible failures, the sins of great consequences, Samson's heart now turned to the Lord, and he was humble. So Samson did what every person does that is humble before the Lord. If they want to get right with the Lord, they start praying. They repent, they turn around, and they pray. You know, it, it, I was going to say this later, later, but it really, it just really sits in my heart. There are so many people out there that are Christians and that are not Christians that feel like the things that they have done and for as long as they've done, you know, as long as they've done them, it's so horrible that God can never, ever use them. And the devil was telling that. And that is just not true. It's never over. Never over. 
Samson had, had dropped about as low as he possibly could. Here he was, the great judge of Israel, and he's in the Philistine basement down there grinding up grain. Things that, would, would, that actually it was, it was reserved for, for animals to do that. And there he was, and yet our God is so good that he just, he knew it, he just repented, he asked the God to forgive him, and then his hair starts growing, and his face starts growing. Verse 23, now the lords of the Philistines, these are the five lords, and all the government with them, gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. 24, when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered us into our hands, uh, into our hands, our enemy. A lot of times people think that in their sin, that all they are doing, their secret sins, all they're doing is hurt themselves, hurting themselves, that nobody else sees it, that it is never, ever true. Your sins affect a lot of people, a lot of people. So you've got to be very, very careful. Generations to come. Uh, at the end of 24, it says, They said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemies, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So when Samson pursued his ungodly relationship, he might have justified to himself by thinking that the only harm was done to himself. Yet here we see that his disobedience led to giving glory to false God, and he was their trophy. <clears throat> They went on to say our God is stronger than the God of Israel because we have captured Samson. What a horrible thing to do. Verse 25, so it happened when their hearts were married they, that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Verse 26, then Samson said to the lad who led him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines, all the five lords, all the government, everybody who was anybody was there. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. 28, then Samson called the Lord saying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle, middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at, the death, at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his fathers, his brother and his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zoral and Ithatol in the tomb of his, his, his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. So after his repentance, after he knows he's, his, he, he, he is getting in, he's in right standing with God, let's put that. <clears throat> the Philistines had brought him out and they just wanted to humiliate him. They thought that their God was stronger than the God of Israel because of Samson. And they wanted to bring it out there for everybody to see. This was all of the God, all of that leadership of, of the Philistines. Remember, there are five cities, or really it's five territories. They were there. The people under them there. All everybody that was anybody was there. And the reason I'm I'm emphasizing this is because so many times you look at the story of Samson and you go, wow, what a failure. You know, he God, just so bad that he never, you know, he just really didn't do what the Lord. Had, 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 had wanted him to do. He didn't do the big, great things. And then I thought, but wait, when I saw that, when it said all the lords, all the lords, that meant that all the men that had put him in that place in the first way had tricked him with paying Delilah were there. They were there that day. All the government was there that day. And when they brought him out, they didn't even have a guard brought him out. If you look, it said, and the lad, they had a little kid to humiliate him even more. You know, some little kid to bring him out. And when he pushed those pillars and it fell on him, he killed all of the government. And the reason I even researched that or even thought about it is because in Hebrews, in the chapter of faith, he is listed there. And when I read it, I went, huh, 
you know, what's he doing there? You know, I mean, he killed, you know, a couple thousand Philistines at one time, but, you know, at the end he killed some. But that's because his, he was restored. He was restored because he, he, he repented. He, 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 he understood what he had done. And then his faith was built up. And his relationship was made whole again. And he used that last bit uh, of strength that God had given him to destroy the government. So he did have faith at that very end. Maybe at bits and times throughout his life. But, but to be in that chapter, this was what that was about. He, he understood. He repented. Man, if that's not a story we need to get out to people. There are so many people, so many Christians even, that once again think that their life is nothing. You know, I can't help but think of, of pastors through the years that, uh, and evangelists through the years that have uh, had an affair. There was one prominent one that had an affair, you know, kept going out with prostitutes. You know, and, and people were just like, cut off his head and send him, you know what? But this guy, this one evangelist that I know, he repented before the Lord. He repented before his, his, his congregation, and, the, and, and he was forgiven. And now his ministry is restored. So we have to remember that. And, and I think a lot of people, too, think that, that, that if they don't... No, you know what? I'm not even going there. If he truly, if the person truly goes to the Lord and asks forgiveness and turns around and doesn't do that sin anymore. It's as if he never did it. And that's the way it is with Samson. Samson came back and he restored himself. And he knocked down that whole, from that point on, if you remember in the very beginning of Samson's story even, it said that he would begin the deterioration of the Philistines ruling over Israel. And that's exactly what he did. This last great pull or this last great uh, death, his, it's, it's almost like it's a suicide, but it's not. It's not. He, because he does it for the better good. He just says, let me kill them all. And he gets killed in the process. So spiritually speaking, Samson lost sight of his calling from God and gave up his greatest gift, his incredible physical strength, to please a woman who captured the Lord. In the end, it cost him his physical sight, his freedom, his dignity, and eventually his life. The wages of sin... Is death. So again, if you have people, you know people, or if you feel, if you feel like you've gotten so far away from the Lord that 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 God can never use you, remember this story. It's as simple as repenting and turn away from those things that you were doing, and then God will restore you. And I mean, that's why He died on the cross. What a great God! There's no other God, little G, like that. He wants you to love you. He wants you to be restored. He wants to use you. So if you have a calling on your life and you have done something that you feel like is so far gone, remember that all you have to do is repent and stop doing it. And then Jesus will just erase it and pull you in, pull you in and love you and use you like he did before. Amen? All right. Let's do our questions real quick. Number one, true or false? God overlooked Samson's sin. False. Number two, complete Genesis 